Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. What an honor to have your attention and your time. We will make it worth your while, I promise. My name is Siobhan Sarna. I'm the founder of SIBO SOS. That's my book back there. And I am thrilled to have two very special people with me today. My co-host, Dr. Allison Seebecker, world-renowned SIBO specialist. Hello, Dr. Seebecker. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and the esteemed Dr. Mona Morstein, who is not just an incredible naturopath and teacher to other naturopaths, but also, side note, diabetes expert. So for those of you who have diabetes issues, you definitely want to get a hold of this woman and get her book. But she also has some formulations for people with SIBO. She is a go-to across... Um, you know, conferences, we always include Mona, summits, we always include Dr. Morstein, because she really is such an expert and brings so much enthusiasm and energy and wisdom to every single case. And we so, are so grateful that you always accept. So thank yes, you. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Really. We don't take that for granted, Mona. Mm -hmm. I do think sometimes we're moving too fast and we don't breathe and just like send out a literal gratitude, but psychically, man, we are all over it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tell us how people can get a hold of you, Dr. Morstein, because I know that's going to be subconsciously what's going on in people's minds. And then we'll get to some great questions. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm uh, my phone number is 480-833-0393. Uh, so that'll get you to um, Nevi Health, where I have my clinic, and um, or and Nevi is n e v y health dot com, uh, one word. So those are ways to track me down. All right. Uh, we are not going live. Thank you. We are not going live on Facebook today because this is specifically for people who registered for our most recent summit beyond SIBO for tough cases and complicated situations and, and symptoms. That's not the right name. That's approximately the name. And, and um, Dr. Morstein created a couple of classes for that, including um, about the overgrown fungal gut. And I know we have a lot of questions. I would ask um, that Anybody who has a question, put it in the Q and A box. Anyone who has a technical issue, put that in chat. And please refrain from doing um, internal conversations in the chat during the presentation because it gets super distracting. And, and I only answer questions from the Q and A because it gets overwhelming. Okay, that being said, um, Dr. Morstein, how long is your waiting list for people who wanted to do an online cons consult? Can we get in fairly soon? Yeah, you know, we always leave some spaces open because they fill up with new patients during, yeah. you know, so we didn't want to block everything off. And so we specifically work new patients in each week. Uh, so just to keep it going and make it make me more accessible. Yeah, some flow. I like that. Okay, from Kristen, I was barely making it out of the house to work after tweaking my diet based on Dr. Seebecker's recommendations, I found significant relief, relief, although super limited diet and at least not constantly on the toilet. Sorry if it's TMI. Questions, does taking curcumin, curcumin, turmeric, help during SIBO treatment? I'm doing the candybactin regimen. Are, are those, so are, are, is it Dr. Is that Dr. Allison? That's for you. That's for you, Mona. That's for me. Yeah. I mean, so curcumin, curcumin. which is, um, you know, kind of a concentrated form of turmeric as um, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. It's not something I personally add into a SIBO protocol just because there's usually enough other stuff to take to try to just kill the little buggers um, by themselves. So there's always, you know, we have to be very wary of pill limits of people. Um, but curcumin, um, I mean, I, I, you know, if I'm going to use curcumin in the gut, I'll use it where there's really a noticeable overt inflammation. For example, with patients who have uh, diverticulitis or something uh, clearly inflammatory in the gut. So okay. it wouldn't really be my first, I wouldn't personally think it's necessary unless there are some other things going on with the patient that I'm unaware of that there's cross purposes for choosing curcumin. Okay, curcumin. Thank you. Um, 
hearts of palms any thought about that i'm going to throw this one to you dr seebecker for the diet is, is this that's mainly fiber right hearts of palm oh um you know i haven't looked at the actual uh makeup of it i i wouldn't want to i'd, I'd want to look at it before i say okay because sometimes you think it's high fiber and it's not right Right. So go check the Monash uh, University app. I'm not sure if it's on there, but we're going to keep going because we have tons of questions in only one hour. Uh, from Mary, if the culture of a small, this is for you, Dr. Morstein, if the culture of a small bowel aspirate is negative for fungal growth, does that rule out candida in the large intestine? Well, first, it doesn't even rule it out in the small intestine. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you know, they're getting the first inches of the duodenum, you know, on a small intestine aspirate. So we've got a lot more duodenum and all the jejunum and all the ileum that is not necessarily really going to be covered with that aspirate, right? So, um, but no, it also has nothing to do with the large intestine microbiome, right? Which will have nothing to do with a small gut aspirate. Okay, in thank terms you. Of, you know, fungal, you know, overgrowth. Okay. Um, let's see. Hello. Jamar? Yes, sir. Uh, if you're in the middle of questions, um, what was the question about hearts of palm? Just does it oh, have a lot of fiber? What was the question? Is it okay for SIBO uh, food list and what phase? Oh, okay. So, oh, phase. So phase would probably be Nerala's uh, SIBO biphasic. But I guess I just would want to say that there's an answer that is an answer that everybody hates. <laughs> I'm prefacing it for any food thing you're asking about, which is that you just have to try it. If it's not, if you don't see it on a list, Whatever diet follow, you're following, it's not you just try it and you see, does it make your symptoms worse or not? So that is my answer. Please don't okay. hate me. Please don't kill okay. me. <laughs> That's the answer. Okay. Um, from Diana for Dr. Morstein. Hello, my gut is covered with biofilm and bad bacteria. What is the best way product to remove it and how long to use it? Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I wasn't really sure there was a lab yet actually being able to specifically diagnose biofilm in the gut. Um, we certainly know that there are biofilms of our beneficial bacteria and probably of our, um, you know, of the ones that have overgrown negatively. Um, you know, when we're looking at biofilm busters, I mean, the strongest one is a compounded prescription medication that I order at times when, um, you know, SIBO protocols say haven't been successful and I want to take some time and work on a strong biofilm buster before doing another protocol. Um, and that's, you know, we're looking at DMSA and alpha lipoic acid and, um, and I'm drawing a blank. What's the third one, uh, Dr. Allison? Uh, I have I have it right there, but you EMPS. know, EMPS, yeah. Uh, so um, otherwise there are products. I think most of us use uh, Biofilm Advanced Phase 2 from Priority 1 and Interface Plus from Claire, Straight NAC, um, you know, is considered a biofilm. So these are things that are used commonly in that regard. And if there was a second part to the question, I forget it. That's bad bacteria. Uh, uh, they oh. have bad bacteria and how to treat it. <laughs> bad bacteria in the colon or the small gut? Let me find it. Uh, let's see. My gut is covered with biofilm and bad bacteria. What is the best way product to remove it? And if so, how long to use it? Um, well, uh, so here I got it right here. So yeah, um, Bismuth, right? DMSA, alpha lipoic acid, and bismuth. How did I forget the bismuth? <laughs> uh, so that's the that's the compounding formula. You know, if you are stopping treatment and trying to work on a biofilm buster, the classic is taking three months. I don't always do that, but I will do two months. Um, so um, if we're trying to really break down biofilm. Now, if we think there's a fungal biofilm, I prefer the product called Colorex. 
um, and um, which is an easy one to do just one a day because most people will get a tummy upset from two a day. Uh, so that is what I use for fungal biofilm overgrowth. But for the bacteria, those other ones I mentioned, and uh, if you really, if it's, if you feel there's clear, it's established a couple of months is a, a you know, two to three months anyway. Okay. Um, by the way, just a little pause here. We have, I've just had Clarissa, uh, who, Clarissa, can you go ahead and put um, in the link for the summit? Because I know a lot of people here have already purchased the summit. A lot of people here haven't, um, but we're so glad you are here because you registered either way and I appreciate it. And I know a lot of you have really already benefited from it, but today the price does go up to that $299. It's still $149 right now. And I'll have Clarissa put that special link up there. Dr. Morstein, we have a lot of questions on your fungal overgrown gut question uh, topic. So I want to get a couple of those in there. What's the most common fungus you see from stool cultures? How often do you see? Is it geotrick? Yeah, geotrichum. So okay. You know, you have the candida species, and there's a number of different can candida species from, of course, albicans and cruci and parasopsilis. And then there, the main other one is geotrichum. There's rhodoterula, um, a saccharomyces, bilardi can overgrow and can potentially be a problem. Uh, so these are, um, you know, the main families uh, or species, I guess, of fungus that uh, you I'll see in stool overgrowth. Okay, Wendy um, is asking: Can antifungals be combined with SIBO treatments such as Atrontil and berberine at methane SIBO recommended dosage and Colorex? Could so that's one question. And then could time be added, helpful with mold, question mark. In general, how many herbs could, should, can be taken at one time? Well, okay. So, you know, so it's interesting. It's, you can, you I mean, there's no rule. You certainly can mix them all together. Uh, sometimes I like to do one at a time. One, to just kind of combine the mind and the body, like this is SIBO treatment and this is SIBO treatment and it's all really focused. And then we know that variable of how well did you get with SIBO eradication. So if you're all better, then who knows, maybe we don't have to deal with the fungus, but if you still have symptoms and you're eradicated, then we know that the fungal does make sense. Or if you do it the other way around, you could do fungal and then, um, you know, SIBO. But um, so a lot of times I like to break it up just because SIBO, it can be a lot of pills and yeah. also that directed mind-body connection, you know, just to have it clear, in the and if your body is just trying to kill too much at one time, you know, can can it do all that together? Uh, so probably it can. Yeah, uh, you know, I want to put limits on the body, but you can mix them all. And the protocol uh, for fungus, I mean, you can add a bunch of supplements in, but um, I mean, for me, the you know, nystatin and colorex and a probiotic is going to be effective in over 90% of my patients in and of itself, right? right? So I'm very happy with not adding in a bunch of other things along the line, uh, you know, and then doing whatever SIBO protocol is necessary. Okay. Um, I'm going to, Kim, I'm going to start doing the elemental diet for SIBO. I think I have fungal issues as well. Would you recommend taking caprylic acid for a week or two ahead of time? What dosage, what doses during the elemental diet? Do you think this works as well as Nystatin? I do not. And uh, just because I see enough stool samples to know, to do, which automatically do sensitivity testing, and caprylic acid is not as sensitive as nystatin is in any way, shape, or form. Um, look, if you're going to do an elemental diet, the most important thing is to do a dextrose-free elemental diet. And then you're likely not going to have any kind of, you know, big risk of overgrowing fungus. It's dextrose that for sure will do a fungal overgrowth in many people. Um, 
So if you're just doing a dextrose free, I think you're good to go. But if you want to throw in caprylic, you could. It certainly isn't going to hurt. Uh, if you have someone who could script you some nystatin, that would be a little more effective. Um, so that would work as well. Okay. From Marcus, I've had SIBO for the past six years, and I can't seem to figure out how to get rid of it. I've taken the antibiotics, the elemental, and I've been carnivore for almost three months and still no results in bl being bloated. What do I do next? That's interesting. I just had a patient do carnivore for two months and completely eradicated her SIBO wow. uh, from a score of 86 to like score of four. It was wow. pretty good. So, you know, remember, here's the deal with SIBO you shouldn't expect that all your symptoms go away. Like it doesn't always, even though you're eradicated and bloating can be its own entity. So, you know, if people get 70% or better with eradication, sometimes then you just have to heal the gut and help in other ways to deal with the residual symptoms. So, I, you know, if you, I don't know if you've tested your SIBO, but it would be good to see what's going on with it at this point. If it hasn't changed at all, then why are you on a carnivore diet? If it's eradicated, now it's just time to move forward and start healing the gut and, and helping it out. So I'm not a fan of just a long-term, say, treatment without retesting. I'm a huge advocate of retesting SIBO and, and, and seeing, did this protocol work? Is it eradicated? Because if the protocol didn't work, like don't stay on it and don't repeat it, do a different protocol. Um, so at this point, you need to retest and reanalyze where is your gut right now? Okay, uh, I'm reading and listening to you at the same time. Uh, how do you spell that colorex? It's K O L O R E X R E X. Yeah, okay, and you. then there's different names. Advanced practitioner. It looks like they're all the same. So <laughs> to me, they all have the same ingredient. So I'm not really sure it matters which one you get. <laughs> Mona, what is the ingredient in there? It's that hirokito. It's that herb from you know from I guess Australia. And um, that's, you know, just this extract of that one herb. Okay. Um, let's see. You guys can just Google it. I, mean, I, I have like so many questions. We're going to keep moving. Um, I'd like, I would like if Dr. Morstein could elaborate on what she meant by liver support if one needs to take fluconazole 100 milligrams. Right. So, so the, so of course, any, uh, um, so fluconazole, all the antifungal prescription medications, but nystatin are going to get through into the body and they have to be detoxed by the liver. And there are reports where people had elevated liver enzymes um, as a result. Now I live in the Phoenix Valley, which is the, which is ground zero for valley fever, which is a fungal respiratory infection uh, here in the valley that we have to treat with long-term fluconazole, right? So um, since we know it gets into the body and it can raise liver enzymes, then look, even just taking some milk thistle every day is going to protect you, right? It's going to protect your liver. So it could be something as simple as dandelion root or milk thistle or some alpha lipoic acid or a little NAC, any of these liver protectants will not will make sure your liver is good because that's actually a low dose of fluconazole, right? Typical doses are 200 a day. Um, so you should be fine. Throw in, you know, a little milk thistle extract around 200, 240 milligrams a day. And, you know, your liver shouldn't have any. And then, of course, I wouldn't wash your fluconazole down with a bunch of alcohol. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you treat your liver nicely otherwise, um, and you should do fine. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Guys, today's the last day to get that summit at that 149. There's Dr. Morstein. She has two master classes in there. They're fantastic. One is on the CFO overgrown gut. Um, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Morstein, about the relationship between CFO, small intestine fungal overgrowth, and diabetes. Oh, uh, well, resistance. Hey, Lori. What so, do you think? you know, so diabetes doesn't cause anything unless it's uncontrolled and then it can cause everything. Uh -huh. So we're talking about uncontrolled diabetes, uh, whether it's type one or type two or LADA, type 1.5, whatever, which is kind of really type one anyway. But the point being high blood sugars feed yeast right? We're making bread. We have flour, water, we throw yeast in. And then what do we do to feed the yeast? We throw sugar in, right? And then the bread rises, right? So in the body where there's a lot of sugar, you can get vaginal yeast infections. You can get jock itch. You can get it growing on your feet. You can get it growing in your gut. You can get it growing on your skin. So, you know, if you've got too much sugar in your body, then yeast can grow wherever it wants to. And that could be either in the small gut or even in the colon. Interesting. By the way, while we've been talking, Clarissa went to our full script account, found that they do sell the Colorex. We have 15% yeah. off for you guys. She'll put the link in the chat. Okay. From Lena. Hi, thanks for doing this question. I feel instant brain fog when I take the Joe Mar labs, amino acids only if taken alone on an empty stomach, what could be causing this feeding microbes high up in the small intestine? It's long. I'm wondering if rapid influx of sulfur containing amino acids increases the gliotoxin production from candida slash aspergillus colonization and worsens H2S SIBO. Gliotoxin biosynthesis requires sulfur since it's part of this molecule. I take a capsule of bismuth sulfate with amino acids, but not sure it helps. And then I'm not getting those key amino acids. Well, I mean, look, I mean, if you eat a piece of chicken, you're getting pretty much the same amino acid. So is it happening if you eat chicken or meat or lamb or foods, you know, or eggs or foods that have full amino acids in them as well? It would be unusual if you're eating animal products with amino acids and sulfurs and it doesn't happen. And then you just take this straight product and it does. And if that's the case, don't take the product. <laughs> <And Okay. either. laughs> so this or is a try another product. Maybe there's just something with Joe Mars processing that's doing it. Now, if it's happening with all of your amino high amino acid foods and Joe Mar, then yeah, there could be a sulfur situation in your intestines, you know, because animal products are some of they're the highest sulfur sources. Uh, so that would be a concern. But if eating the, all the animal product is fine, and just this product, that's, you know, that's going to be hard to interpret. Okay. Um, Plum is asking if you can do the elemental diet more than once. I'm going to say yes, because this is the rest of the question. She's he, Plum, he or she is doing the um, Allison Seebecker homemade recipe and wants to know if honey in your tea during the elemental diet is okay since it's in the homemade recipe. I mean, it's okay, but you might want to then take an antifungal uh, you know, along with it, if you know you're going to be do drinking that several times a day uh, in your homemade formula, which is fine, but that does put your gut potentially at risk also of a fungal overgrowth. Okay, uh, Peter. Hi, I've uh, had. I'm saying hi to you, Peter. Hi, I've had SIBO emo treated and now have developed SIFO while on prokinetics. Is there a probiotic that can help prevent candida overgrowth in the small bowel that wouldn't increase the risk of SIBO recurrence? Both lactobacillus and saccharomyces makes me, my bloating worse. Interesting. Um, well, I mean, look, if you have SIFO, the first thing to do is to get rid of the SIFO. Uh, there isn't a probiotic in and of itself that would do that. Um, the probi there, there are two main probiotics I use with SIBO patients that they seem to handle very well. And 
One is from Zymogen, the ProBioMax DF, and one is from Claire, the Lactoprime Plus. Both, you know, the Lactoprime Plus is a little more broad based. I think that that will, you know, but that does have, if it does, it might, it does have lacto bacillus and bifido species in it. So if you're very sensitive, you might not be able, maybe then you just need something. I, I don't know what you would need. I guess I have to talk with you and find a formula that is okay for you, but you can't, it wouldn't help you before you eradicate the CFO to begin with, right? So you first have to eradicate that. And, um, and then it's not that hard to not get CFO again, right? CFO, obviously antibiotics, um, alcohol, refined sugar uh, are gonna be the three things that are always the bugaboo with fungus overgrowth in the gut as a whole, you know, as just a whole, right? So um, once we eradicate it, if we avoid those things, it, it shouldn't grow back on its own. Tracy is asking if someone has chronic vaginal yeast without obvious gut symptoms, should someone assume gut overgrowth of candida? I mean, of course, you could have a bacterial overgrowth in your vagina. So if you're sure it's yeast and it's been cultured and, and it's a, for sure a, a yeast overgrowth, if that's recurrent in the body, then then we would want to look at, you know, make sure your blood sugars are normal. That is a red flag for diabetes, just wondering. Um, and uh, it, since it's so easy to treat a fungal gut overgrowth, it wouldn't hurt if this is really a recurrent thing. But I don't know what your diet is and what you're eating and and what you're, you know, maybe if we just gave you a, there are, you know, um, lactobacillus rhamnosus and lactobacillus ruteri are our vaginal specific probiotics to help the microbiome get better specific to the vagina. So sometimes tidying up the diet, looking at your blood sugar, getting you on a good probiotic, it may be, um, you know, stopping things like douching or other things that might be irritating a vagina uh, or whether it's also spermicide, who knows, whatever, you know, we have to look at what goes up in there. So, um, you know, whether you need the gut or not, I don't know, but we would truly expect some gut symptoms. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh my gosh, this is a lot, you guys. All right, I'm doing my best. Hi, David. It's good to have you here. Oh, okay, stand by. I'm really, I'm like literally sweating here. Okay, um, Angela, I have a client with SIBO. We have healed the gut and completed two rounds of herbal antibiotics. He continues with gluten and dairy restrictions. However, there's still a reaction with onion and oats, diarrhea. If another round of treatment is required, or is this an immune reaction that is permanent? Did you retest? Thank you. Retest your patient to see where they are with their SIBO. We, okay. we, we can't analyze that until we know if your rounds truly did eradicate the SIBO. Jackie, hi. What type of testing for SIBO would be done for a five, almost five-year-old? Well, I mean, there's only one test for SIBO, so that's just a breath test. There are no stool tests that analyze SIBO. Uh, there's only a breath test. So if if your five-year-old has the capacity to, you know, blow into the, you know, tube and uh, as directed, and we, of course, we would give a, a smaller dose of the substrate, then that's it. Five-year-old is still a little young to get all of that organized. But so as, as soon as the child can do a breath test, we can test for SIBO. Okay. Hold on for just a second, y'all. Just take a breath. We're going to have a little moment here. Uh, this is the list of, hey, this is the list of classes in the summit that's going on. That's today's the last day to get it for the 149. So it was four days, four classes each day, 16 classes. We actually made it easier to watch because often we'll do like 10 classes a day. And we realized that that was a ton. So we tried to make it a little bit more mellow because I know we're all busy and we wanted to give you four at a time. 
So that's what we did. And just to recap, if you, oh, that's my cat, you guys, sorry. Um, there, if you uh, didn't get a chance to watch all of them, here they are. This is a phenomenal buy. Here's Dr. Morstein's overgrown fungal gut class that was brand new, never before seen. How your gallbladder controls the hidden hormone system in your gut from Dr. Sandberg Lewis. If you do purchase the summit, he will be here for a q and A. I I think that is, Allison, when right. is it? Yeah, it's the 17th right. at 4.30 Eastern. And then Dr. Ann Hill will be joining us. This is just for people who purchase the summit. We have Dr. Ali Razai. Oh my gosh, the mold masterclass with Dr. Jill Krista. We have mass cell activation syndrome and long COVID from Dr. Weinstock. Another constipation masterclass. If you didn't see this, and you can't figure out why you're constipated is a must see from Dr. Sabrina Kimball. I mean, these are phenomenal, phenomenal classes. By the way, Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis just came out with his GERD book um, and on and on. I don't need to read at all. You get the idea. Where's Mona again? We have two from Mona. I thought we did anyway. It's floating around here. Even if it's just the one, it's more than worth it. Okay, so here, is, I can't keep it straight. Here's the deal, guys. It's just today at that special price. We're wrapping that up. So I just wanted to offer that to you again. And you are getting two additional Q&As just for those who purchase. Dr. Morstein, a lot of questions about testing for Candida. What tests do you do? I'm going to wrap up like five questions right there with that. So, you know, I'm a, so I do a combination. I do a stool test. Um, to try, you know, to see if we can actually get it overgrown on the stool, indicating in the um, indicating in the large intestine, and then I combine that with a two-page, the original Candida questionnaire from the original book, The Yeast Syndrome, from Dr. William Crook, the MD, who in 1984 wrote the book that brought the fungal overgrowth in the gut phenomenon to the medical consciousness. So he created this two, and I like the two page. There are shorter ones out there. I don't know why we should do the shorter ones. Like the two page one takes less than 10 minutes and it gives a more exacting analysis of risk factors and cravings and symptoms. Uh, so that's the one I've always been using. Now, if the stool is positive, it's positive. Okay, great. There's fungal overgrowth. What if the stool is negative, but then the fungal overgrowth score is clearly positive? That's how I diagnose small intestine fungal overgrowth, because we have Rover on Mars technologically wise, and we have, you know, telescopes that can see the dawn of creation. But there isn't a test for CFO <laughs> anywhere. So we have to kind of extrapolate it with symptomatology, which is generally, you know, you're going to look for certain symptoms in the gut, but also brain fog, because that is so clear a red fog, a red flag for intestinal yeast overgrowth, that if they've got the symptoms that make me wondering, and to do the stool and it's negative and the candida form is positive, I'm set to go. And I'm fairly confident that they're going to feel a lot better in a month. Okay. Um, let's see. Can we talk about when yeast is like traveling through the body versus colonized? What's the difference there? Okay. So in reality, yeast is in the gut, right? Now- the normal in, gut, right? In, in, well, no, well, yes, it is a normal part of our microbiome, but it can overgrow. It can yeah. overgrow in the, in the large gut or in the small gut, but it's generally still in the gut. The problem is, is that yeast is more complicated than the SIBO bacteria in what it produces as toxins. So we have hydrogen and we have methane, they're problematic but the yeast produces acetyl, um, acetyl aldehyde 
uric acid, tartaric acid, like um, they produce arabinose. Like these are many different things that can go to the brain or settle in the muscles or settle in the bladder and can cause problems all throughout the body. Now, people that have um, generally immune deficiencies or had just really significant, intense antimicrobial um, you know, antibiotics can grow yeast in their mouth, uh, such as thrush or even down their esophagus. Um, but it's not generally, you know, elsewhere, even with um, now in the valley fever, which is a fungal overgrowth in our dirt, uh, it goes into the lungs because you're breathing in this fungus, right? So you get lung nodules. And I've seen one patient who it got to the brain, which is, you know, unfortunate. But um, generally what we're talking about is that it's in the gut and stays in the gut, but the toxins are what can get through the gut. All right. So we Let's... call that, we can call mm -hmm. that systemic candidiasis, even though the fungus, which may not even be candida, it could be rhodoterula, but the fungus is in the gut, but the toxins go systemic. Got it. Okay. Let's talk about sugar and sweeteners for a second. Okay. There's that, um, the, the new findings on erythritol linked to cardiac issues. Um, and then what do you think? I don't, I'm not worried about that at okay. all. And then what about allulose? I, allulose I'm okay with. So I put it on the acceptable alternative sweeteners with stevia, monk fruit, xylitol, uh, you know, the combination products. I, I don't see it. Um, I don't see it raise blood sugar in my diabetic patients. And so um, I'm pretty okay with it. Okay. Um, cool. Let's see. Have you ever heard about a racing heart from NAC? I mean, look, I, it's not like that's a common reaction, but we're on planet earth and anybody has the ability to react to anything in any way they want. So uh, if someone takes NAC and gets a racing heart, I mean, that's obviously a very uncommon um, side effect, but I don't disbelieve that a person actually had it. Okay. Um, let's see. Ooh, have you ever seen a link between herpes and SIBO? You mean that having herpes is an etiology for developing SIBO or I having literally SIBO? read it to you the way it was in there. So sure. I, mean, I don't know how as far as I know, herpes isn't in the gut, you know, slowing down the migrating motor complex. Um, so I, I'm not really sure that it could, but Allison, Dr. Allison, have you heard anything like that? I don't know how that would work. No. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even um, if they meant it the other way, you know, I can't see how right. SIBO could. Okay. Now, if you're saying I get a lot of herpes and I get a lot of SIBO, could there just be some problem with your immune system right. that it's not able to keep either, you know, things from proliferating in your body, right? So kind of would go back to maybe something like that. Okay. Well, the, her the herpes was already there. And then the, the SIBO is weakening, is stressing the system, weakening and allowing there to be more outbreaks. Sure. Okay. Or if your immune system can't hold in the SIBO, maybe your gut immune system can't prevent the overgrowth of bacteria. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, during treatment, my herpes activated quite frequently. Oh, yeah. A couple of people chiming in on that. Okay. Well, if you're having that die off, your body might think it's under attack or something. So, okay. If Zyfaxin gets rid of hydrogen, SIBO, wouldn't long-term use of Zyfaxin get rid of methane since hydrogen feeds methane? I'm going to let you answer that if you would, Dr. Morstein. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, obviously I do think if it's, I mean, look, if, I have, if I'm using an antibiotic type protocol or an antibiotic supplement mixed protocol, 
um, with a methane SIBO, I'm, I'm not averse to using Zyfaxin as part of that and then adding things into it. So yes, we do know that four hydrogens equals one methane. And if we're keeping the hydrogen down, yeah, there's less obviously food substrate to enable the methane bacteria to get a footing and proliferate. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, there's yeah. a percentage of people, I think, I think Pimentel even reported that that do get their methane handled by just Rifaxman, but it's a small percentage. Right. Uh, okay, we got Marianne's question. Anne, I understand the diverticulosis could, can be a root cause of SIBO. And I had a GI doc tell me I had it. What is the reason it causes SIBO and how does it work? Isn't diverticulosis in the large intestine? Yeah, so I think when we're talk when we're saying diverticulosis and SIBO, we're talking about a more uncommon um, small intestine diverticulosis. Now, which that can happen in the small gut. Uh, it's not um, as common, of course, as in the large gut. But large gut diverticulosis would not cause SIBO. I think they're just mistaken that it's the small gut anomaly of diverticulosis. Any suggestions for managing diverticulosis to avoid a flare of diverticulitis? Any oh, supplements that help and it's routine okay. and is routine Advil to be avoided? Yes. So um, with diverticulosis, turning into diverticulitis, this is a fairly substantial part of my practice is <laughs> is um is treating people for that. I just actually saw a patient just two hours ago with, who has some chronic diverticulitis. So I always do a food sensitivity test just to see what food enters the gut that the gut doesn't like. For this patient, it was dairy, right? And then I did a stool sample. This patient had four bad overgrown pathologic bacteria, right? So those have to be eradicated. Also, then we have to tidy up the diet, right? So this patient also ate um, some good sugar. Well, sugar is A, one, pro-inflammatory. In fact, that's all it is, is pro-inflammatory. And two, it also really decreases the functioning of the intestine for up to five, um, the functioning of the, of the immune system, pardon me, the functioning of the immune system for up to five hours after having the equivalent of a teaspoon of white sugar, right? Where a can of Coke has 10 to 12 teaspoons, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so we have to tidy up the diet, remove food sensitivities, heal up the gut from any pathogenic bacteria. And uh, that, now, so NSAIDs, which is the medical term for ibuprofen and naproxen and aspirin, those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are devastating to the gut that gets diverticulitis, right? Because it causes gut inflammation, right? So we think about the stomach and it causes an ulcer, but we forget that this is an entire gut the stomach and the and the large and small intestine are connected. It causes just as much inflammation there. Um, so they have to, so NSAIDs are almost a guarantee to have recurrent gut diverticulitis. If you had, if you had it, you're almost guaranteed to get it again if you're regularly doing a an ibuprofen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to be fair to everybody. Uh, I've seen alcohol worsen autism behavior, psychiatric symptoms. When I give herbs, liquid supplements like Iberogast, it has ethanol alcohol. Does that small amount of ethanol in the supplements make yeast and mold react to this kind of alcohol? Hello, Veronica. I mean, it's a really good question. And generally when I'm treating patients for fungal gut, I, I don't use tinctures, right? And I think that's I'm, and I don't want them to drink alcohol for at least a couple of months, right? So it's not my favorite way to work. Now, if you have to give Iberogast, 
Uh, to someone, I guess we can try to work around it, maybe at least give it with a probiotic or, um, you know, or a, a, a gentle antifungal um, supplement. Um, so that would be something now with autism, of course, autism is notorious for um, having fungal overgrowth. In fact, the oat test, which is, you know, was created 30 years ago, only and specifically to be used with kids on the autistic spectrum, um, you know, disorder um, syndrome. So that's that's what it was invented for, which is why it's mainly checking for clostridium, which overgrows in autistic kids, and yeast, which overgrows in autistic kids. And then most of the test otherwise is metabolic abnormalities that might explain the, some of the um, poor connecting and other aspects of um of autism that some kids can have. So it's, um, so, I mean, it's, it's you, most autistic kids should be looked at for a fungal overgrowth for sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. For ele on elemental diet, what carb source would you recommend sticking with maltodextrin? I mean, I mean, I generally use the ITI dextrose free elemental diet. So I just settled on that. And, and that's what I've used at this point. I think based on this one test case that I've had, potentially a carnivore diet could be an option versus an elemental diet. Um, since that, that treatment was so, it, the, the result was so clearly uh, a cure of the difficult SIBO. Uh, but the problem with that is we're not, I don't know how long you have to do it. My patient did it for two months. Can you do it for one month? Can you do it for just the same two or three weeks that you do an elemental diet? I don't know. Uh, but the other problem is, is that not every, you know, elemental diet doesn't always cure it. It doesn't always work. Uh, in patients either. So maybe two or three weeks isn't long enough and we need longer time, um, but I wouldn't keep a person on an elemental diet longer. I guess a carnivore diet is a little easier for a longer period of time. So this is all kind of new stuff for me at this point. Okay. Um, if you have SIBO, EMO, and CIFO all at the same time or worry that CIFO will opportunistically develop during after SIBO and EMO treatment, what is the order of treatment that would space out, minimize die-off? To be honest, I so rarely see any die-off with SIBO treatment. It's just not, I can't even remember the last mm -hmm. time a patient I really had any significant die-off with SIBO. Now with fungus, there's a higher percentage just because they're producing so many more toxins that go, you know, really into the body. So I, I know people talk about die off with SIBO. I, my and my patients, I don't know, we don't, I don't really see it. Um, so here's the deal. There's so many factors. One, are you using antibiotics? Do you have them? Do we have to order them from Canada? That takes a month. We might as well do the fungus while we're waiting, right? Or do you have everything? And we got, you know, you've got everything. We're going to do supplement or, you know, we're going to just do supplements. And so then it's just a choice. Do you want to do one? Do you want to do the other? It doesn't really matter. You can't create fungus by a SIBO treatment and you can't create SIBO by a fungal treatment. So you, there's not like a worry that you could interfere one way or the other. So then it's just whatever the patient wants to do or whatever, I think, you know, it doesn't matter really. I will say that, uh, you know, so it's it, it doesn't matter which way you do it. Okay. Um... How long, Dan, how long can you safely use digestive enzymes? And is there a protocol for weaning off of them if you are not supposed to stay on them long-term? I mean, I'm not sure that anyone ever has ever found that digestive enzymes are harmful to take, you know? So I don't, you could, if someone, I mean, I see quite a number, I have to, you know, of patients with um, 
exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And I mean, they're on, you know, Creon for the rest of their lives, right? But now they're, they're uh, it's just fantastic for them to finally get diagnosed, right? So they're going to be on it forever and it's helping them. So I don't think we could say that there is a time where digestive enzymes are problematic right now. Are we talking hydrochloric acid, which is not really a digestive enzyme, but it activates the one in your stomach. It activates pepsin. I would be where, you know, you want to watch that, especially in seniors, right? And let, you know, just because it's a lot of acid in a senior stomach and there is a company, Dr. Clark store, which just makes pepsin without the hydrochloric acid. And I would feel with seniors, like a 70, 80 year old, like I'm not so sure that being on high, you know, a lot of hydrochloric acid is the best for them, but if they need pepsin, we can just get them pepsin. I'm not also sure that, you know, now weaning off. Um, I mean, if you've been on digestive enzymes for a month or two, just stop. You know, it's not, you know, your body will start up again. If you've been on it for years and you want to just wean down, that's good. That's fine. I, I, you know, I, I, it's, it, it wouldn't be that hard. Go down to two capsules with meals to one capsules with meal to one capsule twice a day to stop, you know, just, just things like that. It would be pretty easy. It wouldn't be a, a, a big deal. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Oh my gosh, you guys have such good questions. Um, we just a lot of questions about which to treat first, SIBO or fungus. I'm just gonna ask you one more time. So, you know, the problem, so here's the deal. It's fungus is pretty easy. You do this diet, you do the antifungals and a probiotic, and you do that for a month. And when they come back better, you can open up the diet and reduce the antifungals and just start this process, right? So SIBO is more complicated and you're gonna treat it and then maybe it's cured and maybe it's not and you have to change it up and then you treat it and then maybe it's cured and maybe it's not. Now, you know, so it's a lot. So sometimes it's easy, just like let's get the fungus out of the way because at least that can help and it's simpler and it's an easier process. And then we can do, cause if we're gonna wait till the SIBO's eradicated before we start the antifungal, you know, that might be two or three treatments at times. It depends how high is the SIBO when we're starting and you know, what, um, how aggressive is it? Is it, you know, how do you have hydrogen? Do you have methane, et cetera? So it's a little more, it, it's more complicated as right. um as a protocol for eradication than the fungus so if you're just like all right let's just deal with the fungus take care of that and then launch into the process that needs to occur for SIBO full treatment okay if you're all saying right. choose okay um I wanted to get to Laura's question here we have an answer I'm, I'm so sorry I've tried um I've been suffering with SIBO relapse every 12 weeks for years and my doctor treats with two weeks of Zyfaximin Zyfaxin Rifaximin and Zyfaxin mixed together you got it it's Zyfaxin I have many risk factors including small intestine diverticulum dot ABD adhesions whiplash is overuse of antibiotics a risk well, first off, here's the deal. You should always stay on rifaximin. You should never get off of it. And I would add in a strong garlic too. Alimed, if you've got the money, or Alimax Pro 450, if you can spend a little less, but still a good product. I see it work just as well. But so here's the deal. If it's coming back, why are we letting, why would it come back? So you need to eradicate it. And for my patients where it comes back, my ALOS to ANLOS patients or patients that are stuck on opioids for whatever problem, or they don't have an ileocecal valve, or you have a diverticulosis, one of those you know rare situations, like I'm going to eradicate it and keep them on a 200 ibuprofen for the rest of their life. And that is, I have ALOS to ANLOS patients that have been on that for four years. They have never had SIBO recur. They're the most ecstatic people in the world. So it's not just treat it, let it come back, treat it, let it come back. It's like treat it and never let it come back. Now, the benefit to Zyfaxin, Rifaximin, whatever, is that considering it's unabsorbed by the human gut, 
considering it has very little effect, if any, on the colon, and it can even increase bifidobacteria, that this is a pretty, this is why we like it. And like, if you come to me with strep throat, I'm not treating you with antibiotics. I'm going to use naturopathic natural medicines, right? I don't like antibiotics, but Zyfaxin is the different kind of antibiotic, right? So, you know, I also like when my SIBO patients go traveling to Asia or India or South America, places where it's likely an American is going to get food poisoning, they're on 200 milligrams of Zyfaxin the whole trip. And everybody mm -hmm. else gets food poisoning, but not them because they're, they're more likely to get it. It could bring back their SIBO. So no, we're not, we don't want it to come back. So you, I would say you need to treat it and then just live you know, on the Zyfaxin and because you have so many, maybe throw in a, a you know, a garlic or some other um, antimicrobial um, broad based um, supplement, right? Um, so that's what I would do. But, you know, because it's worse for your gut to have that cycle through SIBO and that inflammation than to just take something so you never get it back. Do you mean to say she keeps them, did she mean to say she keeps them on 200 milligrams of ibuprofen? No, I no. heard, I heard okay. you say that Mona, it was just a misspeak. She, she went, oh my God, I yeah. meant, oh, did I say, I don't even catch that. I did, I, I did hear it too. So maybe that's coming from the diverticulosis. So I am sorry for everybody for confusing you and not picking it up. I meant 200 Zyfaxin yeah. a day. So, yeah. Thank you for hearing what I did not. So 200 Zyfaxin in a day forever. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Mary, thanks for that. Okay, guys. Um, okay. We have to wrap it up, but I definitely want to say thank you to Dr. Morstein for being here. Give us your contact information one more time, Mona, if you would. Yeah. I mean, it's 480-833-0303. Or it's Nevy Health, N E V Y Health.com. Okay. And we are going to invite everyone one more time. Thank you to those of you who have already been financial and placed your orders. But here is the special event that Dr. Morstein beautifully participated in with the Overgrown Fungal Gut Masterclass. This is why we've had so many phenomenal questions today about fungal gut. And so that was a phenomenal opportunity to learn from her. You also can learn from Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis. If you're looking away, come look at your screen because I'm not going to read it all. Dr. Ali Rezai, oh my gosh, if you have mold, ladies and gents, you've got to watch this class with Dr. Jill Krista. It will change your life. I mean, these all will. Histamine issues, watch Dr. Dr. Leonard Weinstocks. You also have four master classes from Dr. Seebecker. I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Well, they're not there. Hold on, they're down here. Um, <laughs> she talks about diet treatment, um, prokinetics, how to prevent relapse, testing. There are a lot of questions that a lot of you still have. And the vast majority of the questions here were covered in the content of this summit. So please don't hesitate. I promise you, you're going to learn something new and transform your health and get you closer to your goals of being well once and for all, because you all richly deserve it. So if the price is going up tonight at midnight, um, it two two ninety nine, and it is right now one forty nine. Here are those master classes from Dr. Seebecker. Underlying causes. Hello, SIBO diets. It's a long one. Totally worth it. And just play it in the background. Um, treatment and prevention, and then prokinetics to help you prevent relapse. Which I would say at least thirty percent of the questions that are on here, if you're not on a prokinetic, it could be causing the problems that you're experiencing. So and Dr. Morstein, yes. If you haven't heard Dr. Morstein's, Morstein's class on yeast, we've been answering all these questions. You have to listen to it. And look, Lena, thank you for saying, she says, Mona's masterclass was an amazing masterclass. I've been studying for a while and she's saying it's amazing. And Lena's a doc. So okay. if you missed it, get the summit and watch it. And the people who order the summit will have this recording in the summit as well. So 
let me just tell you, they're 16 in there. They truly legitimately are $59 each, which is still a bargain and a half. So if you do the math, 16 times 59, I don't know, it's a lot. So <laughs> you're hurting my brain, Siobhan. So please join us for it. We're very proud of these events. They help people globally around the world. We get wonderful reviews and feedback and we appreciate you all so much. Dr. Morstein, love you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Take care. All right. No, Linda, it's different than the SIBO Recovery Roadmap course. It is definitely different. The SIBO Recovery Roadmap course is a step by step plan for you to follow the nine step algorithm that Dr. Seebecker, cattail, um, has used to help thousands of patients um, that most of these SIBO specialists all use. And this is different. This is literally called Beyond SIBO because it is those extra classes that are about these additional topics. So um, master classes different than the course. Thank you so much. Mm. UTIs, just personally from being in the SIBO Facebook group, I do see that a lot of people have um, UTIs more frequently than before when they do have SIBO. I have to go, but I love you all so much. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you'll join us for the summit and then come to a smaller group Q&A with Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis, uh, as, as well as Dr. Ann Hill. They both have phenomenal masterclasses in the summit and um, I'm glad you were here today and every day. Oh, thanks. Bye-bye everyone. Thanks, Clarissa.